No. No. Oh, oh. Seven. Lonesome baby. It's a uh, crazy baby. How I remember things. My hair came from and how you have nothing. I made you fly. Put extra on your ride. Chicago, they snapped it up and they're doing their own. Let me introduce you to the man who's got the balls to do that on his own, ladies and gentlemen, Gabriel's Box, Andrew Ho. Thank you so much, Mike. So, welcome to 20 by 2 Chicago. I'm going to try not to bring both mics into here. So, you know the premise? Does anybody here not know the premise? I bet a few. So, what we have here is 20 people getting one question, the same question, they get it a couple of weeks ahead of time, and they have two minutes to do whatever they want, anything they want, to answer that question. And we get to show that to you this very evening. So, uh, one of the great things about it is you have no idea when you get here who's going to be reading. Well, you know who, who's going to be reading, you don't know when they're going to read. So hopefully a couple of your favorites are going to be out here uh, pretty soon. Um, we've got everything from film to video to, uh, uh, well, those are the same things, aren't they? A little nervous, like you said. Who does this by themselves? Um, I actually have a great team who is helping. But uh, so we have speedy, uh, we have uh, speakers. We have uh, a, a, actually a drawer. We'll see that in a moment, and uh, a few other things that I think are going to challenge you and make you think, and hopefully make you laugh, maybe even make you cry. So. Our question tonight is, how could you? Uh, we'll be doing this at least, I'm hoping, twice a year, so the next time it'll be a completely different question, and completely different speakers for the most part. Anyway, let's get started. Brandy Agerbeck and, uh, of Loosetooth.com draws and thinks for a living. As a graphic facilitator, she makes giant maps of her clients' conversations, making them tangible and transparent so people can see what on earth they are saying. She speaks and writes about drawing as a thinking tool. Tonight, she's the silent partner to Chad Kalis of Waxy.us. Chad is suitable for many uses, among them musicianship, filmmaking, and integrating technologies. His imaginary friend is a genius. Chad and Brandy answer tonight's question with a taste of synesthesia, translating one sense into another. Chad and Brandy, how could you?
Can you give us a hand with the screen? Oh, for right. sure. Pressing all sorts of people into work here. Multiple uses. Multiple uses, yes. Our next speaker is Felix Young. Felix runs Avoision.com, a personal blog that he's updated daily since July 2002. His online projects have been featured on sites like Boing Boing and Metafilter. He currently works as a front-end developer for Sears Holdings, and in his free time is working on an iPhone app called Augur, which uses Twitter to predict the future. Here he is to show us how could you. Felix? Um, my talk is on friendship and betrayal. Um, I talked with my friends and complete strangers outside Millennium Park and asked them two questions. Number one, what is the worst way that you betrayed a close friend? And number two, how could you do such a thing? This is what I found. Betrayal. I slept with his sister. How could you? Easy. She was hot. <laughs> Betrayal. I super glued my friend's penis to the skin above his penis while he was blackout, passed out, drunk. How could you? I was also drunk and mildly upset with him about something. I was young. Betrayal. My older, my older friends and I read her diary all the time. How could you? She was fake and lied a lot. We wanted to know what was really going on. Betrayal. I twice had sex with my best friend's recent ex-girlfriends. How could you? I was doing it to them, not to him. <laughs> Betrayal. Leaving the country without saying goodbye, owing him money for a cell phone bill after a personalized tour of Kyoto on his dime when I knew he was in love with me. How could you? I was a selfish and entitled coward. Betrayal. I accidentally burned the side of his house down. How could you? I used too much gas. I like this, I like this answer because it suggests there was the right amount of gas that could have been used. Betrayal. I dropped her like a hot potato for flirting with my ex-husband. How could you? Because how could she do such a thing as flirting with my ex-husband? She betrayed me first. Betrayal. My grandma let me borrow her car after living with her and everything. And I totaled her car while going to an ex-boyfriend's football game. How could you? I was very fearless and irresponsible, and I feel terrible about it every day. Betrayal. I robbed their house. How could you? Strung out on drugs. Betrayal. Hooking up with the girl shortly after they had broken up. How could you? I don't know. She tricked me. I got tricked into it. <laughs> Betrayal. I have not returned telephone calls. She has gotten ill, and she calls me incessantly. How could you? I have decided that I cannot continue the friendship because it's too toxic for me. Betrayal. I tell my dog that we are going on a walk, and I put her harness on and everything, but then I clip her nails, which she hates. How could you? How could you? Someone has to clip her nails. Betrayal. Stealing from them. How could you? I didn't really think of them as a close friend until after I lost them. Betrayal. I had two boyfriends at the same time. How could you? My heart. I just followed my heart. Thank you. Leah Jones has called Chicago home for 12 years, blogged for 10 years, baked challah for 8 years, and hasn't been to a drum circle in at least 5. <laughs> she started biking all over Chicago 3 years ago and finally learned to love Malort this summer. Most of that is true. And now she has 2 minutes to explain how could she?
The other night, I sent a friend a gif of a stumbling hedgehog with vertigo. It was my way to distract her from the fight that we were headed towards. And if there's one thing I don't know how to do, it's how to fight. Don't get me wrong, I can handle confrontation, as long as it's with a stranger, in a public place over something that will make me feel like a righteous victor in the end. Like that dude who sat behind me on the Delta flight from Minneapolis and bitched about the flight attendants the whole way home to Chicago. I confronted the hell out of him when we landed. But I can't fight with anyone I care about. I never learned how. My parents grew up in abusive households, hitting, yelling, making my dad come home from lunch over lunch break to serve soup to my grandpa. When my parents had kids, they decided to break the cycle of violence, vowing never to hit, never to yell, never to send us to bed without any supper, not even when we set the kitchen on fire making a batch of homemade fireworks. <laughs> totally happen. They are the type of people who keep a case of the book when bad things happen to good people by the front door to give to any friend or acquaintance or friend of an acquaintance who is hurting. And they never fight. I mean, they have disagreements. Do not ask them about the dog. But they don't fight. They simmer quietly in different rooms for days. And in breaking the, silent, the cycle of violence, they may have started a new one. One where I don't know how to turn to someone who hurt me and say, how could you? I guess a cycle of silence is better than a cycle of violence. But maybe there's a third option that, doesn't, that neither simmers or explodes. And I hope that I can find it before I have kids and I'm faced with the same dilemma as, as them. But until then, can I interest anyone in a staggering hedgehog? Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. One of the great things about Chicago is there's so many awesome shows like this, and uh, I encourage you to uh, seek out some of the others that you're going to see uh, or hear readers from, and sometimes organizers from, um, wherever they may be, including the next one. Megan Steelstra is the literary director of Second Story, where she regularly tells stories to drunk people. Her story collection, Every Mo Everyone Remain Calm, was a Chicago Tribune favorite in 2011, and her essay, Channel B, was included in the Best American Essays of 2013. That's this year. You should go pick it up. It's out there right now. Uh, her next essay collection, Once I Was Cool, comes out... This summer, or did it just come out? This coming summer, 2014, give it up for Megan, and how could you? In 2004, I lived in Prague in a three-story walk-up owned by this enormous hairy Russian dude. He didn't speak English, I didn't speak Russian, and so all of our transactions about the rent or the lease happened through his daughter, this lovely, awkward 14-year-old girl. Over the course of several months, she and I built our own complicated language out of hand gestures and broken check. I don't think I've ever listened as hard as I did when I was listening to her voice. So when I woke up in the middle of the night to screaming, I knew that it was her. I jumped out of bed, ran to the window, and there, three floors below me, lit like a stage show from a nearby streetlight, was my landlord and his daughter. It happened so fast and blurry and loud and louder, and I couldn't tell if she was screaming in fear or fury or both. I couldn't tell if he was throwing her out or trying to keep her there. I couldn't tell who hit who first, but there was no mistaking the fact that he outweighed her by three times. The force of him knocked her off her feet. There was nothing to catch her but the cobblestone, and her body was bent in impossible directions. It was so fast. It was so dark. I didn't understand what they were saying. I didn't know the cultural norms of Eastern Europe. I didn't know the Czech equivalent of 911. If I did call the police, what would I have said? Ha help? Name of Chesky? If something is happening, can you sense it? Prospia prosim? And, and what would have happened then? If he went to jail, what would have happened to her? She was just a girl. Wasn't she? She was his daughter. Wasn't she? 
in all those months of living there, I realized that I never considered her story. And of course, it's not appropriate or acceptable or advisable to ask, right? It's none of our business, right? Someone getting hurt below our window or in the building next door or two neighborhoods over or in some other city or country or community, and there will always, always be an excuse for us to stay silent, a seemingly good excuse to do nothing. I did nothing. How could I do nothing? In my memory, I have apologized to this girl a thousand times digging through our shared patchwork of language to find the words, I am so sorry. I should have done better. I will do better. And in my memory, I tell her how this time I will rush down the stairs and put my body between theirs. How this time I will rush down the stairs, and if I'm not in time to stop it, I'll still be in time to help, to get her to a hospital or a shelter. This time I will grab the lamp off my bedside table, maybe a knife out of the kitchen, a bomb out of the bathroom, and I will take aim, squinting one eye down at the top of his skull and knocking him out from so many floors above. This time, this time, I will scream. I will be so fucking loud. I'll wake the goddamn world. Thank you. And now we get to our first video segment. Ann Elizabeth Moore is a USC Annenberg Gettys Arts Fellowship member. Fe excuse me, journalism fellow, a Weinberg fellow at the Newberry Library, a Fulbright, Fulbright scholar, and the author of several award-winning nonfiction books, including Unmarketable the Can uh, and Cambodian Girl, co-editor and publisher of the now-defunct Punk Planet and the founding editor of the Best American Comics series from Houghton Mifflin. Uh, Moore teaches at the School of the Art Institute uh, of Chicago, and she contributes criticism to The New Inquiry, The Baffler, uh, Jacobin, and many others. And she writes a monthly comic strip for Truthout called Lady Drawers on gender, labor, and culture. We got some fans in the audience, that's great. Uh, her latest book from cantankerous titles is called The New Girl Law, and it was said to be a, a post-empirical proto-fourth-wave feminist memoir by Bust Magazine. Yes. Here's Anne to introduce her answer to the question, how could you? Thanks, Andrew. It's funny that um, I happened to be finishing this film called How Could You when Andrew asked me to do this show. It's about um, an adorable, cuddly little bear you might be familiar with. Thanks.
I should, I should mention the bar is open if you need to get a, get a drink. <laughs> And by the way, we're going to be just plowing right through, so do feel free to go and refresh yourself if you need to. Um, we are kind of tight on time, so uh, without further ado, Scott Smith grew up, grew up in the suburbs of Chicago before moving into the city proper in 1998. He spent the years since doing a bunch of things online for magazines and brands and also drinking scotch. Available at the bar. He currently lives in the South Side with his wife and daughter, and he can be found on Twitter at, at Our Man Chicago, where he is probably pissed about something or other. The next two minutes are Scott's to tell us, how could you? Thank you. I'm going to do a little bit of this because, you know, you've seen this. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So... <clears throat> How could you? The weight of those words is almost crushing. Eleven letters assembled into a sentence and topped off with the most accusatory of all punctuation, the question mark. This phrase has labored under a shadow, brought out only to address the simple or the impetuous. It never sees the light of victory, of great accomplishment. But language is a living thing. And so I stand before you tonight with a plea. Let we who gather here turn this phrase from a signal of mediocrity into a bright, a beacon of greatness. Let flow these words from your lips to praise gods and goddesses who walk this earth as mere mortals. Let how could you hail others with phrases that burn with the fire of accomplishment. How could you have bested them with merely your wit and inner fortitude to guide you when others failed? Society! is in your debt, madam. <laughs> How could you have found the inner reserves to look failure in the face and stare it down until it wet itself? Well done, sir. <laughs> Do not misunderstand me as we sit beneath the shelter of martyrs. I seek not to give you a license for dickishness. Do not go forth from this place and be the jag off we seek to overcome. <laughs> Nay, from this night forward, let how could you belong to brave men and women who dare to eat lustily from the fruit of life. And let he or she which hath no stomach to this fight, let them depart. Their passport shall be made and crowns for convoy put into their purses. We would not die in their, the company that... Um, you know, I was reading through the St. Crispin's Day speech from Henry V when I was putting this together, and uh, I must have accidentally cut and pasted that in. So, my bad. Um, where was I? Must have fruit of life. Okay, so, but the next time someone turns to you with a twisted face and an accusatory wagging finger asking, how could you, I implore you to turn right around and bellow, why? Haven't you? I bid you a good evening. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. So, Marissa Wasselik is a storyteller. Rarely seen without a pen and a notebook, or a video camera, or her iPhone. She blames her inability to choose a medium for her stories on having come of age at the crux of the digital, digital revolution. She hates it when you ask her, what are you? But it takes sadistic pleasure in making up elaborate answers to the question. I suggest you try it later. A writer, illustrator, a digital communicator, and a dreamer, she is ever ready for the next creative challenge. Currently, she is secretly working on a semi-autobiographical children's book and she authors too many blogs to list, but you can follow her tweets, which are mostly about social media, links to pictures of food and complaints on poor customer service, at at Marissa Page, with an I in there, P-A-I-G-E. And now let's hear her take on the question, how could you? Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. So... Um, I know you saw my name on the roster and you're like, oh yes, Marissa Wasalik, she's so creative, I can't wait to see her. But all of you guys know, all of you who are creative folks 
and wear that heavy crown of creativity know that it is a process and it is a it is it's hard it's work and I want to take you through actually how I went through my creative process to create this 20 by 2 presentation and it's actually a choose your own adventure story so I'm going to need all of your help to get through it uh, I'm going to give you several options of things that actually happened to me as I was working on this presentation and by round of applause we're going to go through the different avenues in this creative journey together. So let us begin. So let's say a colleague of yours asks you via email, I'm doing this 20 by 2 thing and I think that you should do it too. And um, it's answering how could you, so would you do it? And you're like, yeah, I love holding a microphone. I just don't know what to do exactly. So you... Uh, <laughs> Either A, ruminate on the word could until it starts to look weird, or B, scour the 22 by 2 website for performances you can rip off and hope nobody notices that you're just blatantly ripping it off. What would you do, A or B? A. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Round of applause, A. B, let's go with B. Oh shit, we got 15 seconds, let's go with B. So, you watch and get mesmerized by the wonderful chops of the Andrew Huff for hours and make a, and make a gif of it. <laughs> and you still don't know what to do, so, you're, so you just stare in front of your computer and hit the star right there. <laughs> and then it messes up. <laughs> and then suddenly you have a 20 by 2 presentation Two minutes are up. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. There's actually several avenues that that goes to, so maybe I'll tweet about my. Uh, I'll, I'll tweet a link to the different avenues it goes down. You can see a cute little cat video later. <laughs> so yeah, we'll we'll put that up on uh, on the 20, 20 by two Chicago website if uh, it's that done. So twenty by two dot org slash Chicago. Uh, is the website for more information and for future events. Take a look. You can also follow us on Twitter at, at 20x2shy, C-H-I. Jenny Procopi is, a, is founder and editrix of chronicbabe.com, where she draws, from, draws on her experience with fibromyalgia to teach women to live incredible lives in spite of illness. She tweets at, at chronicbabe, as you might expect, consults with amazing healthcare clients, speaks on stage across the country as well as right here in Chicago, loves anything pink and orange, and wants you to have fun even if you're sick. She's been perfecting a keynote on acceptance and, and its role in living with chronic illness. Tonight though, she only has two minutes, so she's going to offer this condensed version. Jenny, how could you? in kicking ass despite chronic illness. It eases all kinds of suffering, death of a loved one, job loss, sudden injury, running out of clean undies. You already have something really powerful that you, to help you live better today, and you don't need to read, buy, or do anything besides learning to think just a wee bit differently. What is acceptance? It's looking at what is here and now, acknowledging it as truth. Acceptance is not giving up or giving in. It is getting real. Acceptance appears in spiritual and cultural practices around the globe. In ancient China, Taoist scholars said, under heaven, all can see beauty is beauty only because there is ugliness. They knew that accepting the bad led to finding joy in the good. The serenity prayer is one of our most prominent cultural manifestations of acceptance. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. This prayer for millions is the first step toward massive life change. Children deal best with adversity. They have resilience. They bounce back. How many tough little nuggets have we met who face cancer or rare disease? Compared to most adults, these kids are way more prepared to live in the moment. They accept what is here and now. My fave pop culture moment of acceptance is the Bjork song, It's Not Up to You. 
if I wake up and the day feels broken, I just lean into the crack and it will tremble ever so nicely. She continues, I can decide what I give, but it's not up to me what I get given. In those short phrases, she accepts what she can't control and she prepares herself for potential awesomeness. What does acceptance look like in my life? I have pain every day, but I don't fight it like I used to. I feel exhausted all the time, but I see it and I manage it, and I have systems and processes and cushions in place to take care of myself. So how could you learn acceptance? Start now. Close your eyes. Breathe deep. Feel the sensations in your body. You are here now. Think of some struggle you have you have no control over and embrace it in your mind. It is part of you. Breathe into it. You are alive. Practice this every day. It gets easier. And if I can do it, you can too. Thank you. Thank you. I feel much calmer now, don't you? GPA is the greatest poet alive. And he hails from Chicago. Seems to be a trend. He has written four books on poetry. The latest is Revenge of the Orgasm. You might want to pick that up. GPA has won the Moth Story Storytelling Slam, the Poetry Pentathlon. I'm picturing that. Was it an iambic pentameter? Oh, it, I know, dad joke, sorry. And recently, the Urban Images Magazine Talent Search. He can be seen uh, on upcoming episodes of NBC's Chicago Fire and Chicago PD, as well as ABC's Betrayal and CBS's Mind Games. Verified, veri veritable TV talent. We got it right here. GPA, tell us. How could you? One, the zeros had went across the scoreboard. Our beloved Bears had just held on 27 to 21 and ended the two game losing streak against the New York Giants. The crowd went nuts in the Hooters. The beards started flowing. The wings got hotter as they piled up. The waitresses whew, were looking wonderful. And all was festive. Everybody was celebrating, slapping hands until a couple entered the doorway. They weren't striking as they were awkward. The man, he was a giant husky Hulk looking fellow who reminded me of Jethro Bodine from Beverly Hills, but he's but just modern day. The woman, she had a strong resemblance with a itty bitty ring I could barely see. His wife, resemblance to Jamie Presley's character on My Name is Earl. The skanky redneck trailer park trash. But what was really remarkable, or unremarkable rather, about them was that they were wearing matching moldy green, disgusting yellow, Green Bay Packers Aaron Rodgers jerseys. And they had come to the Hooters where we sit and watch the Bears games each and every week. As they entered and waited for seating, they looked around. The silence was obvious. The stairs, deadly. Their answer to our question, which had an exclamation point at the end of it, was to turn around, leave the establishment, and seek satiation for their hunger elsewhere. <laughs> which left us with our beers, our wings, the beautiful waitresses, and asking, in this lovely city of Chicago, how could you? Thank you. We've reached number 10. Speaker number 10 is Kevin Newsom, who once hit Roy Orbison in the back of the head with a plastic football from the middle of the crowd at Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Orbison, who was, at the, was alive at the time, did not press charges. Also, during a stinted radio, Kevin once, on a dare, worked the phrase 
pumping the wattage to your cottage <laughs> during a commercial break on a radio tax show. <laughs> That's talent. He's pretty sure that no one was listening anyway, which is probably true. Critics say Kevin has shaped his career around big ideas and occasional sight gags. And there's it's seldom been truer than at 20 by 2 which he launched at South by Southwest 14 years ago. We have the founder right here, right in our midst. Could also be during his time with Yelp, which included two turns as sketchy Santa Claus at the Yelp Chicago Holiday Soiree. If you were in either one, either one of those, he's sorry and you're welcome. He lives in Austin. He, as well as the other guys who helped make 20 by 2 happen at South by Southwest every spring, uh, are all here, right now. They're somewhere out there. Where are you guys? Wave. There's a couple right over there. They're the reason we're doing this thing. It's kind of crazy. Uh, he is, as you imagine, you can imagine, you might imagine, not famous. But please welcome Kevin anyway for his turn to tell us, how could you? First of all, it's really hard to follow a good Hooters story, so I'll do the best I can. Um, and a uh, quick round of applause for Andrew, who's been so So, so Andrew Mitchell, we've been doing the show for 14 years, and as part of that, I've spent a little bit of time on stage, but really the star of 20 by 2 is always the question. And so, um, it occurred to me that I'm not famous. And if you're in the audience tonight and you think you might be famous, here's a test that you can do to see if you're famous. And it works like this. What you need to do is find a famous person and talk to them. Tonight we're going to find out how can you feel famous without actually being famous. I once bought this man a cup of coffee. We had a nice chat for a little while until he got bum rushed by some fans and then he ran away. I met Pop Pop at South by Southwest a few years ago. I don't know why we're both in frames. Uh, I tried to shake his hands and he wiped his hands on my jacket instead. <laughs> I once bought this guy a beer, and I asked him why, when I saw him the week before performing karaoke, why he was really looking at the word super hard when he was singing spoon songs. And he said it was because I wanted to know if they got him right. I think he was lying. But really, there was only been one time in my life when I truly felt famous. Because other than that, like, you're, just in, you're having a conversation with someone who has fame. Uh, and it happened in May of 1990 in the Lubbock Memorial Coliseum in West Texas. <laughs> this is what that layout looks like <laughs> if you're keeping score at home. So basically, uh, I, had a, I had a friend at the time who was program director of a Midland uh, radio station, and when, and when top 40 traveling shows come through West Texas, they'll only pick one of the three cities that, that dot the landscape over there because there's just not enough people to do all of them, whatever. Anyway, so he was up with a van of runaways or whatever, coming to a show in Lubbock, and, uh, and uh, gave me a VIP pass to go to this show that I probably wouldn't have bought a ticket to otherwise. And so the VIP area is actually under the bleachers. And so we went back there and had beer and hot dogs and got to rub elbows with you know, hammer pants. And, uh, and I was eventually going to try and make my way to the seat. Well, the lights go down, and so it was really dark. And as I'm walking out to go to my seat, hot dog in hand, uh, right about here comes a guy running as fast as he can, and the spotlight hits him right as he's right next to me. And everybody in the place goes batshit insane <laughs> and cheers right at that spotlight. And I'm standing in the dark with a hot dog, and I have never <laughs> felt more awesome in my entire life. <laughs> and that guy was this one. <laughs> 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 Here's the great news. We are a little ahead of time. So we're going to take a quick 10 minute break. Be back in your seats in 10 minutes for the second half. That was perfect. It was the halfway point. 